Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Hina, and I'm the current chair of the SRP Webinar Working Group. And I'd like to welcome you to another SRP webinar this lunchtime in partnership with AURPO on an introduction to proton beam therapy facility design. I've got a couple of things that I need to mention just before we start. In terms of number of attendees, we've had more than 160 people register for this webinar from all over the world, which is a fantastic turnout. Thank you all for tuning in and supporting us. Next, just a couple of ground rules for how we run these sessions. Apologies if you've heard these before. Firstly, questions, you can ask them at any point through the Q&A box on your screen. There should be a little icon of a question mark inside a speech bubble. So if you press on that, uh, you, can, you can type in your questions. Uh, all the questions that are asked will be published and you can, you can like them uh, if you'd also like to know the answer to it. Then the most liked ones are gonna be the ones that we'll put to Jill at the end of this presentation. And any that we don't get time to answer, uh, during today's session, we posted to our events page later on. In terms of registering your attendance and being able to claim CPD points, please email the code P plus B plus T exclamation mark to Charlene. Her email's up on the screen right now, and then you, she'll be you'll be given an email confirmation to show the CPD points that you've claimed today. And finally, please, please, please send us your feedback. There'll be an online survey link for this after the webinar that we sent to you. Um, so just let us know what you think, how you think they're working, anything that maybe we can do to improve them. Uh, next up is a plug for some of the, the next few webinars that we've got lined up. So we've got an introduction to clearance in March and radiological risk assessments in April. Uh, so please book by visiting SAP website and hopefully see you then. Finally, while you're here, if you're not already a member, I'd just like to remind you of the benefits that you could be getting if you were. So you'll get the Society Journal and a weekly newsletter and be eligible for discounts uh, for attendance to any of our conferences or full day virtual events. More than that, it's just a really good opportunity as a member to keep up to date with radiation protection, get access to job vacancies and get involved with the Society in general. So if you do fancy joining, then again, just head over to our website and you can sign up there. Uh, finally, for, in terms of professional status, we do offer these three levels of professional registration. There are a couple of videos on our YouTube channel describing what they are and how to apply for them. And there is a plan to run a future webinar on this topic too, so please just stay tuned for that. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor P Peter Cole, who is the past president and president of AUR. Over to you to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, well, welcome, everybody, uh, and hello. And for those of you who are regular uh, attendees at these webinars, you'll have heard me say this many times before, but I'm going to say it again because I think it's important. And it's this, that I am very, very pleased and proud to say that AURPO and SRP continue to collaborate in delivering this series of ongoing webinars. Today's speaker is my good friend and colleague, Jill Ray. Jill is a fellow of the Society for Radiological Protection and she's director of Aurora Health Physics, where she acts as an RPA, an RWA and an MPE for many clients. Jill is a specialist in Monte Carlo modeling, particularly MCNP, for shielding calculations, amongst other things. In particular, for proton beam therapy facility shielding, uh, notably the first NHS proton beam therapy facility at Christie Hospital in Manchester. Jill's interest in radiological protection began while she was a BNFL sponsored student, leaving Imperial College with a BSc Honours in Physics. Her RP career started by completing the Ministry of Defence Graduate Health Physics Training Scheme and then going on to manage the dosimetry office at Devonport Royal Dockyard. In 1998, Jill changed direction to become a clinical scientist with the Regional Medical Physics Department in Newcastle, where she acted as RPA and MPE for many hospitals in the north of England. Jill has contributed to the second edition of IPEMS Report 75, design and shielding of radiotherapy facilities and for her contribution to the radiation protection profession she was honoured with the award of the SRP Founders Medal in 2019. So without further ado 
Over to you, Jill. Okay, thanks, Pete, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just share my slides. Hopefully, everybody can see that. Okay, so today I'm going to give you a whistle stop introduction to proton beam therapy what it is and why we want to use it to treat patients, but also some of the challenges it presents both for the clinical team and for the radiation safety design of facilities. First though, as a slight introduction um, to why I'm speaking to you today, although Pete's done quite a good job, um, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about Aurora. We're an independent UK company that provides radiation protection services from cradle to grave for a wide range of work with ionising and non-ionising radiation. For facilities, it starts with the radiation safety design and assessing the potential environmental impact of the intended work, moves on to practical support during the operation of the facility and finishes with the decommissioning of the buildings and remediation of sites ready for its next use. Collectively, with expertise in the design of facilities in all sectors, though as Pete said, I do tend to specialise in radiation protection design that uses Monte Carlo particle transport simulations which are needed where you can't use empirical methods to determine the shielding solution. We also work closely with the project teams with regard to the commissioning of facilities. The handover of buildings usually happens before the intended equipment is installed and the construction team often need to confirm that the built facility offers the level of protection that was specified in the radiation protection design. We use a variety of radiation sources, including a portable LINAC to do this, and we try to do it before the final finishes have been applied to ensure any remedial work that's required doesn't impact the project programme. With regard to proton beam therapy facilities, as again Pete <laughs> very kindly said, Aurora provided the specialist radiation safety design support for the first NHS high energy proton beam centre at the Christie Hospital. And we worked very closely with the project team and the trust throughout the design, the construction and the commissioning of the facility. We've also been involved with the design of a number of other proton beam centres and high energy experimental accelerators, both in the UK and abroad, as far away as Australia. So how is proton beam different from normal external beam therapy or traditional external beam therapy? Well, there are a number of important differences, both in the radiation hazard and the access to individuals who have experience with using the equipment. In PBT, the energy of the primary beam is an order of magnitude larger than traditional Linux and the primary radiation hazard is a scattered neutron field, something we'll come back to later. There are only a few centres in the UK and a few rooms in the UK, compared to several hundred LINACs in tens of centres. In addition, the technology and the clinical use of the proton therapy equipment is still evolving, with science and engineering advances resulting in accelerated technology getting smaller and cheaper and making proton beam therapy more accessible. With regard to the facility design itself, for a large centre with a number of treatment rooms, like the one shown here, sorry, the image quality is not very good, um, the amount of shielding material required and the intricacy of the design with regard to the penetration, the technical term for holes, for electrical and other services throughout the shielding makes the design complex. On top of that, the local power grids often don't have enough spare capacity required to operate the facility. And so you might need to factor in the cost and the permissions and the siting and all those other complications that go with including a new local substation if you are considering proton beam therapy. So why would we bother? Why is proton therapy important? Well, the first person to suggest that protons could be an effective treatment method for medical purposes was Robert Wilson in 1946. He's widely recognised as the father of proton therapy. However, due to the physical size of the facilities needed to generate the high energy proton beams at the time and their experimental nature, the first treatments were actually performed in particle accelerators built for physics research, um, notably at the Barclay Radiation Laboratory, which is on the right here in 1954, and Uppsala in Sweden in 1957. And you can see the size of the hall next to that building um, while that um, accelerator was being constructed. However, the wide use of protons was limited by the need to be able to very accurately determine the target or the tumour volume, and we'll come back to that later too. The first hospital centre was actually based at Carter Bridge on the Wirral. The Douglas Cyclotron was originally sponsored by the Medical Research Council for neutron therapy trials, but in 1989, funding from the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, Cancer Research Campaign and some local charities 
led to the introduction of treatment for tumours in the eye. The 62 MEV proton beam has a maximum range of 31 millimetres in water and it's perfectly suited for treating any position within the eye. The Clatterbridge Centre is still operating today and has treated over two and a half thousand patients. So why do we want to use protons for radiotherapy? Well, the success of the therapy relies on the physical properties of protons and in particular the way they deposit their energy in materials. While moving through material, proton beams release only a little of their energy as they travel, but then release almost all of their energy when they come to rest. And this is known as the Bragg peak effect. The fact that protons deliver almost all of their energy, or dose, at a depth which is dependent on the initial beam energy, means that in radiotherapy, the dose delivered to healthy tissue outside of the tumour volume can be controlled and is much lower than with conventional X-ray and electron beam therapy, as you can see here. Like radiotherapy treatment, proton beams will damage and over the course of a treatment kill cancer cells. However, because proton beam therapy clinicians can target the tumour cells more precisely with protons than with x-rays, sculpting the dose to completely penetrate the volume and space of the tumour, but without irradiating nearby areas, they can protect healthy tissue and vital organs. And this is particularly important for cancers which are close to sensitive organs such as the eyes and the spinal column where the damage can have serious life-changing effects. In fact, proton therapy can reduce the dose to healthy organs that are in the beam by up to 80% compared to uh, normal traditional Linux and reduce the risk of secondary malignancy by up to 50%, improving patient outcomes. Unfortunately, tumours are not usually hom homogeneous or located in homogeneous material because human bodies are full of things that move and change in size from day to day. This results in range uncertainty, and to quote Professor Tony Lomax, who's, who's quite a, a, a well-known person in proton beam therapy, the advantages of protons is that they stop. The problem is that you do not always know where. So what is range uncertainty? Well, in an ideal world, there's nothing unexpected between the proton beam entry point and the target volume, as you can see on the left here. However, if we don't know there's an inhomogeneity in there, and we don't compensate it in any treatment plan, the proton energy and therefore the dose will be deposited before the tumour, essentially the Bragg peak moves forward. On the flip side, if we think there's an inhomogeneity there and there isn't, or what is there isn't as significant as we thought, the proton energy is actually deposited on the far side of the tumour, it's in the tumour again. Practically, this means that treatment plans must account for things like cavities which fill with gas, so sinuses and the bowel, dense targets in low density surroundings, such as your lung, and moving targets, which might be due to breathing, weight loss in the patient during the course of the treatment, or more particularly, changes in the tumour volume throughout the treatment, as shown on this paper in the right, Richard Amos. As a result, detailed imaging is required to deliver proton beam treatments. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, for decades, proton therapy remained a cancer treatment offered only at a limited number of physics laboratories. And whilst this was partly due to the scale and complexity of the equipment requirements, was also due to the limitations in imaging capabilities, both for planning and during treatment. However, advancements in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer in the last 10, 20 years, including the improvement in image quality and real-time imaging capabilities, has ultimately helped to make proton beam therapy more practicable. So how many centres are there? How, how widespread is proton beam therapy? Well, there are around 120 facilities worldwide, 40 of which are in America, 29 in Europe, 18 in Japan and a few others um, in other countries. Here in the UK, we have five centres um, with the second NHS centre at University College Hospital London, uh, University College London Hospital, due to open later this year. The NHS centres have varying equipment with three treatment room, rooms each and a research room, and the private centres use single room um, IBA solutions. How many do we need? Do we have enough? Well, the Cancer Research UK in estimates that only one in 100 people with cancer would be treated more effectively with proton beam therapy, so a few thousand people per year. Currently, patients who might benefit from this therapy are referred to the UK Proton Clinical Reference Panel and are then treated at either the NHS Centre at the Christie or referred to the Rutherford Cancer Centre in Newport. Some patients are also still sent abroad for treatment, although NHS funding for this will stop once the second centre 
at ECLH is operational. However, proton beam therapy is still very expensive, with the two centre NHS service costing several million, hundreds of millions of pounds, compared to a few tens of millions for new conventional radiotherapy. So what are the options for your proton therapy centres? In a large centre, as shown on the left here, a single accelerator, either a cyclotron or a synchrotron, supplies a proton beam for a number of treatment rooms, which can have gantries in, as shown in the, the two centre rooms, and you can see the scale of those gantries from the size of the bed, um, or into a fixed beam um, treatment room. A cyclotron uses a uniform magnetic field and varying electric current to produce a beam with a fixed maximum energy, and then an energy selection system is used to reduce the energy and the intensity of the beam to the required values. A synchrotron uses varying magnetic fields to produce a beam with the required energy, and then beam shaping filters can be used to create the, the desired clinical beam. Cyclotron systems have much higher losses than synchrotrons because you're always generating that high energy beam, but synchrotrons um, historically have been larger in size than cyclotron systems, so the overall space can be similar. As I said, the gantry rooms are typically three storeys high um, because there's a limit on how quickly the proton can be bent as it travels through that gantry. Um, and fix, but fixed beam rooms are typically single storeys. They are considered by some fixed beams to have limited clinical um, applications, although that's one of those things that, that there's a bit of uncertainty there and a bit of dis disagreement between uh, clinical teams. There's also single room solutions, which is shown on the right here, the IBS Proteus 1, um, which include compact accelerators and less than 360 degree rotation gantries, so more patient movement. And there's also some novel solutions being developed, such as this linear accelerator arrangement at the bottom, which is based on the injector for the larger high energy accelerators, um, such as the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And it's also possible to accelerate protons and other charged par particles using high energy pulse length. Um, and these solutions might be important where you're trying to fit proton beam into a, a, a limited space. Ultimately though, there's little difference to what the patient sees and the patient experience between proton beam and traditional X-ray beam therapy. Patient positioning is still critical with PBT making use of immobilizers and patient specific molds in the same way as traditional external beam radiotherapy. So what about the radiation safety design for proton therapy? Well, there are a number of things that you need to know, some of which you'll be quite confident about on the day the centre opens, such as the initial workload and the current regulatory requirements. Although well, I won't necessarily know these when you start to design the facility because that process can take some time. But there are a number of things that are likely to change over the lifetime of the facility that you may be less sure about at the design stage, including changes to clinical practice and equipment upgrades for example, might hyperfractionation be used, meaning more doses delivered per year and more patients are treated? Or might the equipment be upgraded over time to offer a high, higher beam energy, which could perhaps be used for imaging, or a higher beam current? To determine, determine amount of shielding required, we need the source term and the required level of dose outside of the facility. With regard to the radiation source, you'll need to know what, the, what equipment will be installed, what type of accelerator is being considered, and what the losses there might be on the beam transport system. Also things like the maximum beam current and the maximum beam energy. You'll also need to know what the beam delivery options are. Will it be a large airy beam delivered in a single exposure with patient specific filters to shape the beam, um, such as for ocular tumours? Or will it be pencil beam or spot scanning that uses magnets in the nozzle to move the beam to essentially paint the tumour? And even when spot scanning is used, sometimes there are specific filters that are used. And also there's even been a consideration of using the bed in terms of the beam delivery. With regard to the dose rates and predicted doses to staff and others resulting from the use of the facility, you need to know who these people might be, where they might be and for how long, and whether there are any local constraints over and above of any legal requirements. For example, you might want to limit the doses and the expected dose rate and annual dose outside of the shielded areas so that you don't need to change working practices if you have pregnant staff. You might also need or want to limit access to areas outside of the accelerator, or you might want to keep that as an option to give you some flexibility in the design, in the design later. When you're giving design advice, 
even if you're not certain, you do need to assign values to all of these parameters in order to work out the shielding that will be required. You need to try and address the possible changes over the lifetime of the facility, as it is very likely, it's likely to be very difficult to increase the shielding provided, should that be necessary in the future. Or you at least have to have good documentation regarding the bounding case for the facility in terms of recording the maximum dose delivered per year and the maximum beam energy that the design will cope with. As well as radiation safety aspects, you also need to remember that proton beam therapy needs to be integrated with other patient services, particularly for paediatric cases where treatment often requires the patient to be anaesthetised to keep them still. Back to that range and certainty issue. Now at this point, if you don't know anything else about proton therapy other than what I've told you, you might be wondering what the shielding issue is, as the proton beam stops completely in the patient, right? Well, when protons do finally stop, they transfer a significant portion of their initial energy to neutrons, giving rise to a reasonably isotropic high energy neutron source with a dose rate of several grade per hour. And it's incredibly difficult to design a proton beam therapy facility using empirical methods. This is mainly due to the fact that the proton beam generates this diffuse secondary neutron field, and this neutron field in turn generates tertiary radiation both during nuclear interactions and when the neutrons are finally captured. In order to apply empirical methods, the neutron field must be simplified in terms of the energy and direction and spatial variation. And in order to calculate the effect of scatter from materials in the room, simplifications must be made. Although equations do exist for the determination of neutron scatter down the maze, these are generally only valid at low near thermal energies, and we're starting at energies up to the maximum energy of the proton beam. As a result, although the empirical methods can be used as a starting point if you have a blank piece of paper, they often give you dose rates of predicted annual doses which are more than an order of magnitude out, either too high or too low, depending on what assumptions you've made. As a slight aside, in my experience, the question of how much shielding do I need is exactly often approached from the other direction, in that I've got this much space, can I fit a proton beam therapy facility in? And actually often the question is not really, but we'll try. So how do you design proton beam therapy facilities? Well, you build and run a Monte Carlo simulation. The Monte Carlo input details the radiation source, so in this case, the collimated proton beam, and includes a geometric, geometrically accurate physical model of the facility, including concrete structures um, and also big items like accelerator magnets, gantry, gantry counterweights, bending magnets, things that could affect the neutron and proton scatter field, and the relevant physics parameters to run the model. The Monte Carlo output is specified to contain the information which is required to estimate the dose rates or calculate the level of activation inside and outside of the facility. And these models also allow you to um, assess scatter through penetrations, of which some of which are, are quite large and quite empty, things like the uh, magnetic quench pipes, magnet quench pipes and accelerator. As an example, this slide shows the difference in shielding requirements for a cyclotron accelerator facility with external walls above ground or on the top and a synchrotron situated in a basement. As the cyclotron emits the same energy beam for all exposures, there are losses, although there are losses in the accelerator itself, the main losses are in the beam extraction and along the energy selection system, which degrades the beam to the required parameters for the patient treatment. The synchrotron has two main loss points within the accelerator itself, but then, and the deflection, the extraction. But locating the facility underground means that the dose rate adjacent to the walls can be higher as there's no access to that area. And this means the walls are less than half those in the cyclotron example for this facility. Whether or not the accelerators are a cyclotron or a synchrotron, when the beam's been delivered to a treatment room, there are losses at a number of different loss points that need to be considered. And this plot, dose rate plot, shows the, the layout of a multi-room facility with the losses in the accelerator, the gantry to connector where the beam is bent into the room, the gantry bending magnets, and into a patient phantom uh, as indicated in that min middle treatment room. You can see from the plot that there are likely to be measurable dose rates in the adjacent treatment rooms. However, this is usually acceptable for proton beam therapy centers fed by a single accelerator, as when the accelerator is operational, access to all the treatment rooms is controlled. You do have to be a little careful though, because the radiation quality factor for neutrons varies with energy. It's low, around two, for high, very high and very low energy neutrons, but it peaks at more than 20 for neutrons of around one MV. 
This means that unlike photons, neutron drostrates do not always fall off with distance as you might expect. And in addition, materials have different transmission properties depending on the neutron energy. So putting more material in the beam doesn't always decrease the neutron drostrate, at least not initially. As I said earlier, neutron shielding calculations are not really very intuitive. So back to our earlier comparison between proton beam and Linux facilities. If you get the design correct, then the, the dose rates outside of the treatment rooms in a proton beam facility are actually quite similar to those in a traditional Linux facility. And the level of shielding required for a fixed beam proton room is similar to a 15 MV Linux. Although you do need to remember that for the gantry rooms are often more than one story high. So whilst the thickness of the wall might look similar, the total amount of concrete is not. So we've talked about the design, but to close the loop, we also need to think about how we're going to test to make sure the facility is providing the protection we've specified or assumed or we need. It's really important that as part of the design process, you provide details of the neutron and the photon dose rates you expect to measure in some key locations so that you can check the facility is providing the expected level of protection when it's commissioned. You'll also need to check other design assumptions, such as what losses have been measured in the installed system. An added complication is that neutron monitoring equipment can be complicated to use and expensive, and some doesn't measure neutrons up to the maximum energy that you might be interested in in a proton beam facility. This means that you might need to know the neutron spectrum in different parts of the facility so that you can check the suitability of your instruments. Um, and you would normally try and do that with Monte Carlo modeling rather than trying to measure it because that's complicated too. Finally, with regard to the design, you need to think about the activation of materials. Although there often, often isn't much choice in these for the user, particularly for the equipment components in the ground underneath the facility, but you might be able to limit the amount of steel in the design or to specify low concentrations of certain isotopes, such as europium in the concrete or cobalt in the steel, to limit the amount of activation in these materials over the lifetime of the facility. From a practical point of view, you'll need to consider the discharge of activated air during operation and make provision for the removal and disposable disposal of activated children materials and soil potentially when the facility is decommissioned. Regulators will typically require you to have arrangements for sampling or monitoring the building and ground during the life of the facility to keep an eye on the levels of activation and keep your decommissioning plan and perhaps more importantly your budget, budget up to date. With regard to the activation of components that make up the proton beam equipment there is some available information and from current facilities or operation facilities. But as none of these have yet come to the end of their lives, there is a limited real life information on which to base the estimates for decommissioning costs for the equipment itself. As I said, Monte Carlo methods can be used to estimate the likely activation of materials over time. However, it is difficult to estimate the worst case because at lower energies, you might get higher activation in concrete close to the source, but with higher energies, and if they use more over the lifetime, then the range of neutrons may increase and that increases the potential activation outside of the facility. Just to mention some other things that you also need to consider when you're designing any facility really. You need to remember with proton beam, as well as understanding the regulatory requirements, you need to sufficiently understand the clinical use of the equipment and the technical requirements and the likely future changes in order to provide robust advice regarding the design. And I would always recommend that you stay involved through the design and construction process to make sure you're aware of any changes, such as the inclusion of spare penetrations in poured concrete or the use of sacrificial materials to form penetrations that aren't indicated on the building plan so that you know about it and that you know about any issues during construction, such as where concrete densities that were specified weren't met um, from the concrete QA measurements. And this means you'll be able to update your expected dose rates and your um, design requirements for the facility if you need to. So after that really quick whistle top two, I think my take home messages are that proton beam is still an emerging modality. There are still lots of uncertainties with regard to the facility and the use. So if you can, you should try to include some flexibility in your design advice. And the design itself is complex and um, it doesn't lead itself very easily to empirical calculate use of empirical calculations. So I would be aware of doing it yourself without support from someone with experience. Finally, if you are interested in PBT, then I would check out the PT COG website. Um, it's a really useful website. It's got lots of free information, lots of useful penetrations um, and a, a 
open access journal. And that's my with stopped here. Thank you very much. <laughs>